Chapter Seventeen: Knights and Samurai. The English Code of Chivalry. The knights who lived in England's castles got their land from the king because they were good fighters. They were better at fighting than at anything else. So when there were no wars to fight in, these knights wandered around the countryside fighting. They threatened peasants, rode over the crops, killed animals, raided monasteries, and stole from churches. So the leaders of the Christian Church began to teach that knights owed loyalty to God, not just to the king. A knight had a sacred duty to defend the church and to take care of the weak, women, monks and priests, widows and orphans. Knights were supposed to be more than just good fighters; they were like policemen, responsible for protecting others and making sure that laws were obeyed. This new way of being a knight was called. Chivalry. Chivalry meant that a knight had to be brave, loyal, honest, generous, and good at fighting. He had to fight for the church whenever it was threatened. He had to love his country, honor his lord, and fight his country's enemies. Most of all, he had to protect women. And if a knight fell in love with a lady, he had to promise to serve her and to do any task she gave him, no matter how difficult it was. Becoming a knight was a long, complicated process. When you were seven, you would begin to learn how to ride and how to fight with a sword and spear. Your family might send you to stay with another family so that you could train with other boys. In this training camp, you become a page. You learn how to put on heavy armor and how to carry your shield properly. You learn how to take care of a horse and how to clean your saddle and bridle. You might even practice charging with a spear, but your spear is a broom handle, and your horse is a wooden horse with wheels pulled by other pages. When you are fourteen or so, you become a servant to one particular knight. Now you are called a squire. You look after the knight's horse and armor, help him to put his armor on and take it off, clean his armor and weapons after a fight, and take care of all his needs. In the meantime, you go on learning how to fight, and you also learn how to be polite, how to speak courteously and eat neatly, how to carve meat and serve it, and how to behave at a great feast. Finally, you go through a ceremony in which you become a knight. You go to the lord's castle and spend an entire night praying in the castle chapel. The next morning, you take a cold bath and dress in three colors. A white shirt to remind you of purity, a red cloak to remind you of the blood you will spill as a knight, and brown pants to remind you of the earth where your body will be buried. You go to the great hall of the castle, where you swear always to be faithful to the church and to your lord. The lord taps you with a sword and announces, "Now you are a knight." He gives you a sword of your own. And a priest blesses you. Now you have a squire of your own, and you can take part in the first big tournament of the year. Hundreds of knights will be fighting in this tournament. You have your own colorful tent on the tournament grounds, where your squire helps you get dressed in your armor. Knights used to wear chain mail made out of thousands of tiny steel rings linked together. But this chain mail won't stop the blade of an axe or the point of a lance. So instead, you wear armor made out of plates of steel hinged together. First, your squire helps you put on a thick padded jacket to cushion your armor. Then he helps you step into the plate armor legs of your suit. He fastens a chain mail skirt around your waist and then straps on your back plate, your breast plate, and your arm and shoulder guards. You're starting to feel hot. But you're not done yet. You put on leather gloves and pull on plate mail gloves or gauntlets over top of them. Your squire straps your sword under your belt and puts your helmet on. It covers your whole face except for narrow eye slits where you can see out. Your friends only recognize you because of the special symbol painted on your shield. This symbol or coat of arms tells everyone who you are. It is painted with gold and scarlet paint, so that other knights can see it far away. You walk stiffly out of the tent and over to your horse. 
Your squire has to hoist you onto your horse. You join a parade of other knights, riding in front of the ladies of the court. The ladies look carefully at all the coats of arms. If they recognize a knight who has broken the rules of chivalry and been rude to a lady, they can point at him, and the heralds will order him out of the tournament. But no one points at you. And finally, it's time for you to joust. Your squire gives you a blunt-ended lance, and you trot down to the end of the ring and turn around. Another knight is waiting to charge at you. The herald gives the signal, and you kick your horse into a gallop. The other knight looks enormous, thundering towards you on a huge black charger. You grit your teeth and close your eyes and feel an enormous jolt on your lance arm. For a minute, you think you are going to fall backwards off your horse, but you manage to catch onto the high front of your saddle and pull yourself upright as your horse gallops on towards the end of the ring. You hear the crowd shouting your name. As soon as you can pull your horse up, you wheel around to look for your opponent. His horse is galloping off into the distance, and he's sitting on the ground with a shattered lance in his hand. You've won the joust!